On today's show, the Atlanta Hawks get on the board in the series, knocking off the Boston Celtics by a final score of 130-122 to in impressive fashion. Trey Young, DeJounte Murray, Sadiq Bey, Bogdan Bogdanovich, everyone played well for the Hawks in this spot. We'll break down all of what transpired in the game, what's to come for Atlanta, and more on the way. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1457 of the Lots on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Friday evening, deep into the night, into Saturday. And I want to thank you at the top of the podcast, making it your first listen each and every day. Check us out across podcast platforms at Lots on Hawks, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, etc. And I do appreciate you listening to the podcast today. As you might have noticed already on the video side or elsewhere, I have a bit of an odd recording setup today. So my apologies for the lack of video. I'll be back in full force with video and better audio quality after game four on Sunday, but just take my word for it. If you are an everyday listener, you will definitely appreciate this. I will do my best always to get you some podcast content after a Hawks game. And I had a scheduling conflict this evening, travel, etc. but we're here and the Atlanta Hawks pick up a badly needed win on this particular Friday evening, 130 to 122. They're now back within a 2-1 margin in the series against Boston. And look, the headliner is that the Hawks were awesome offensively in this game. They ended up scoring 74 points in the first half to lead by 7 points. They're up 12 with like 14 minutes to go in this game. Got a little bit dicer than they wanted to, for sure, down the stretch. But they put it away eventually with the work of some quality offense throughout the night. And as we always do on the podcast, we're going to the specifics in a second. But I want to start by saying that it was basically the archetype of what a Hawks game looks like in this series and what they win in this series would actually look like if it was probably going to happen. It was Trey Young. And DeJounte Murray combining for 57 points, including some huge shots in the fourth quarter. Per ESPN, Trey and DeJounte are the first pair of Hawks teammates to have at least 25, 5, and 5 in the same playoff game since 1966. That's a very long time, obviously, but those guys were great down the stretch and really good the entire game. The Hawks also had great balance in this one with eight players having at least eight points. The bench was much, much better in this spot, as you might expect at home, uh, particularly with Sadiq Bey and Bogdanovich. And then also, you know, the defense had some issues for sure, but they made enough stops, let the offense kind of cook in front of the home crowd. I talked about this with Glenn Willis in my most recent episode of the podcast, and I was convinced that at least one of the two games at home would be close, and it would come down to who made plays and who made shots in particular at the end of a contest. And this one, it was Jason Tatum missing a pretty wide open three that would have tied the game for Boston late, and then both Trey Young and DeJounte Murray making big, kind of contested, difficult shots at the end of the game to seal it. And some of that is a make or miss league. And that's part of the deal in the NBA at the very, very highest levels. But the Hawks made shots at home in front of their home crowd and really a fantastic win for Atlanta, not only because it was at home and in front of the home fans, but for the fan base to not get swept here, all that stuff, like to see a win with the stars being stars, guys making shots and really a fun game all the way across the board, uh, national TV, all that fun stuff. So a fun night at the office for Atlanta. And we'll get into kind of what transpired in the game now. So I'll go to the offense as far as my takeaways are concerned. And it was definitely an offense first win for this Hawks team, a 128 defensive rating, meaning the Hawks scored almost 1.3 possessions, sorry, points every time they had the ball in this game. They shot the ball incredibly well. And they were due for that. You know, I, I've definitely made the point in the first two games that the Hawks had other issues in addition to their shooting questions, but they did not shoot the ball well in either of the first two games. And that flipped in this spot. 63% from two point range in this one is an awesome figure, and then 44% from three. And yes, it was not the same level of just enormous volume as it was in Game 2, but the Hawks shot a lot better from three-point range in this one, and when you make shots like that, you actually win games. Uh, There was a time, as we'll get into later on in the podcast, where Boston was shooting an obscene percentage from three-point range, and the Hawks were still winning. It was because Atlanta was playing well and also making shots. I think my friend Kevin Chouinard made this point later on that I'll probably touch on again, but the Hawks probably played better defensively at times in Game 2, but the Hawks played so much better on offense in terms of shot making and execution and all the uh, top level stuff in game three that it was much cleaner, obviously, on the way to the victory. They also rebounded the ball very well on offense. 
They grabbed more than a third of their missed shots. That's a huge figure for this team to have those extra possessions, and especially that was important because the Hawks turned them all over way too much, actually, in this game. There was one sort of black mark on offense, and that was it. 19 turnovers leading to 29 points for Boston. Usually when you do that, you're not going to win because it kind of just gives the opposition all of those transition points and all that fun stuff, but the Hawks shot the ball so much better, it didn't necessarily matter, but I will just kind of flag that now for Game 4. The Hawks cannot afford to have that level of ball security moving forward on a regular basis. No free throw attempts in terms of like high level margins there. 16 uh, in the game is not terrible, that's not a ton, but they did hold Boston to exactly the same amount, so no huge loss there on the margins. Defensively, the Hawks had a 118 defensive rating. That is not fantastic by any means, and usually it's pretty hard to win when your opponent makes 21 three pointers in the game. That is a ton of threes, it's hard to overcome that, but Boston cooled off a lot. 15 of 25 in the first half, but only 6 of 23 in the second half. And that allowed the Hawks to get some more stops. They were good defensively at times in this game. They were not fantastic all the way through by any means. But the Hawks were competitive. They, they played better inside the arc in this one. Um, they held the Celtics a lot to sort of a lot fewer easy buckets at the rim in this one. They did a great job on the glass defensively. That was very important. They didn't force a lot of turnovers, which is not great necessarily. But they And they basically were dead even in the possession battle as far as like who, which team took more shots in this contest. But... The Hawks actually, in a direct inverse of the rest of the series, were the team that actually made their shots at a higher level in Boston. Even though with Boston making all those threes, the Hawks were more efficient with their shooting, both from two-point range and three-point range in this one, and that allowed them to get out of there with a victory. Um, the Hawks were underdogs in this spot, as you might imagine, at home. It was only five and a half points, according to our friends at FanDuel, after it was like 10 or 10 and a half points um, in game one and game two. But uh, I want to give you sort of the breakdown now of kind of what how this game started. So we're, gonna, we're only going to have one break on this podcast, a little bit shorter on this kind of bonusy episode over the weekend. But the Hawks, I, I saw some people kind of clamoring for a lineup change, and I get it. The Hawks have been pretty consistent, though, and not changing their lineups to start the game. No changes there. They did close the game with Sadiq Bey at the four, and that was the right choice. We'll get back to that later on, but he was very good in this game, and I definitely appreciated that decision. But the Hawks were up early. They did have one change defensively. They ended up playing Capella on Marcus Smart. It didn't really work because Smart had a great shooting game, but at least I appreciated that um, uh, you know, tweak, to something different to kind of throw up Boston. But outside of free throws, the Hawks scored their first 18 points in the paint in this one. For as much as three-point shooting got a lot of attention later on, Trey was more assertive, uh, sort of getting downhill in the early going, and the Hawks did a pretty good job on that front. They did have uh, some Derek White foul trouble for Boston early in the, in the game, which probably helped the Hawks. And uh, not a huge drop in quality to Malcolm Brogdon, but Brogdon was in the news actually on Friday. He got booed a little bit in Atlanta for some comments that he made about the Hawks fan base at Boston Shootaround. And look, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole right now, but uh, that's what you should see. You know, if a guy kind of, and he's, he is from the Atlanta area, um, a guy makes that kind of comment, Hawks fans should boo him. That's kind of what's supposed to happen in the middle of the playoff series. And it, it did, and that was probably the appropriate uh, sort of reply from the Hawks fans. Anyway, uh, Boston did have a couple of threes early on, and there was a bunch of those all the way through. A couple of bad moments defensively. Brogdon blew by DeJounte a few times. Um, Hunter got beat on a back cut. There were some defensive mishaps throughout this game, but rotationally it was pretty similar to what it's been. Uh, for the last little while. Uh, the nine guys who played were the nine guys who've been playing every game. And J Jalen Johnson's obviously the number nine of nine. He played the least, but everybody else was kind of in their, in their normal roles. The Hawks were not making jump shots early, but they were attacking the rim. In fact, they were 0 of 5 from 3 to start this game, which makes it even crazier that they finished this game 15 of 34. So they were 10 of their last, uh, tw sorry, they were 15 of their last 29 from 3. That's obviously a fantastic percentage. Bogey and Bay kind of got it going when they came into the game, and the Hawks were very good on offense, just couldn't get stops early on. Boston made nine threes in the first quarter, etc. But the Hawks did have sort of a small lead early in the second quarter because of the shooting um, and offensive barrage they kept kind of having in that, in that stretch. Bay made his first four shots. Joe Johnson made two threes. Bogey was really hot also, and I said it before once, I'll just say it again now. There's sort of an old NBA adage that's not 100% always the case, but certainly does happen more often than not that supporting pieces, like your role players, your bench players, especially young guys, but even you know even veterans too, tend to play better at home. And not only play better, but shoot better. And that happened in this game. You know, Sadiq Bey was really good in game three, and he was really bad in the first two games in this series. He's not that young of a guy. He, you know, he's a fourth-year player, uh, sorry, third-year player, but it was an older college guy, so he's not super young, but he's a supporting piece. And guys like that 
tend to be better at home, and he was really good in this game. Jalen Johnson was much better than he was in the first two games. I'm not sure if it was only because he was playing at home. It's usually not exactly because of that, but sometimes it just helps to be in front of your home crowd, and that definitely was the case in this one. The Hawks had their, honestly, their biggest run of the entire game in the middle of the second quarter, a 20-3 to push by Atlanta to go up by 14 points with about four minutes to go in the first half. Collins made a three, Bogey made a three. The Hawks, have, in fact, at one point were eight of nine from three-point range. After missing their first five, they were shooting almost 70% from the field in that stretch. It was pretty crazy. They were not quite as crisp late in the half, but still got into the halftime break up by seven points despite getting up 15 three-pointers. In fact, the Hawks tied their franchise record for seven for points and a half in the, in the playoffs with 74. That's a fantastic number, a 145 offensive rating in the first half. Um, they shot the ball incredibly well, 16 assists. They had five guys with nine points or more. Bogey had 15 without missing a shot in the first half. And the craziest stat, even though it was because the Hawks were winning, Boston, again, shot 15-25 from three, and they were down by seven. It is very, very hard, just intuitively, to think about a team making 15 threes in a half of an NBA game and being down by seven points. In fact, Boston was the first team in playoff history to make 15 threes and a half and be losing. The second team overall in the NBA in 25 seasons to make 15 threes and a half and be down. And that's crazy. So the Hawks were so good on offense in the first half that they were able to withstand all of those barrages from Boston three-point shooters. And after halftime, defensively, the Hawks were better. Offensively, not quite as just nuclear, but the Hawks did a good job and obviously kind of just held serve from the second half after building that lead in the first half. So we'll get into how all of that happened in the second half in a second, as well as my individual player observations at the end of the podcast. But first, a word from our sponsors on the show today. Today's show is brought to you by Nissan, and Nissan's most electric player of the week is brought to you by the all-new, all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria. This week's choice is going to be DeJounte Murray. While there was plenty of competition for this one on the heels of a game that had Bogey and Sadiq Bay and Trey Young playing well, DeJounte gets the call. And by the way, the Nissan Aria is brilliantly fierce, fiercely elegant and suddenly powerful. It's bringing impressive combinations of traits together, and it's the perfect crossover. Murray was awesome in the first three games of this series. He's been their brightest spot at times, 26 points. About seven rebounds, six assists, and only two turnovers per game in the first three. He made a huge shot in late in this one. And, um, you know, in as far as the roster is concerned, the Hawks' difference between last year and this year, Murray's the number one reason for that. I thought the Hawks would have been cooked in this game even. They probably would have lost without DeJounte Murray, even though, was, even though Trey was much better, etc. Murray's been a super valuable piece for them. And in this playoff series, he's made a lot of big shots along the way. The Nissan Aria packs the power that will pin you to your seat, and it also has premium intelligence all in one EV. The all-new, all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria is even for people who love to drive. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. Today's show is also sponsored by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every single player is a perfect fit for you. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part has to fit just right. So the next time you're looking for parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay's guaranteed fit, you can be sure that every single part that you need fits right. That's so the first time around, just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. It's just like in sports. Confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home and win when the right parts are actually guaranteed to be there for you. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices at ebaymotors.com. One more time, that is ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. All right, so after halftime, Boston tied the game pretty quickly. Uh, by, by the eight-minute mark or so, he's done by Jalen Brown, and really a rough start for the Hawks, honestly, in the third quarter. It was disappointing in a lot of ways. They lost attention to detail on offense and defense, really. Some breakdowns, some bad shots, etc. But fortunately, they responded from there. I thought it was a good job by Quinn Snyder, and everybody involved to kind of just settle in, not have that get away from them, and the Hawks kind of battled from there. They actually had an 8-0 run right away to take control again. The Hawks never trailed again in the whole game. They went up as many as 12 late in the third quarter. Uh, gave up a three low late to Grant Williams at the end of the quarter. Go by only seven at the end of the third. They played dead even in the third quarter overall. Basically identical numbers even, like all the way across the board, shooting and turnovers, etc. So the Hawks did a pretty good job of kind of just hanging tough with a lead. Um, and then, though, in, early in the fourth, it was all Boston for a while. A 9-0 run going back to the end of the third quarter. And the Hawks called timeout with about 90 seconds of the fourth quarter starting. Only up by three points. And it was definitely wobbling at that point in time. The Hawks were able to keep the lead, though, uh, basically in that three to five, seven-point range for like five, six minutes. Tatum had a dunk to force a timeout again. They used Capella down the stretch along with Sadiq Bay, and Bay played for a very, very long time in the second half. I'm sure he was absolutely gassed, and people were asking about this. I definitely liked sticking with Bay, and you know, uh, at least for the everyday listeners, you will know that I am a big supporter of John Collins. I think John Collins is underrated at this point in time. 
etc. But with Bay playing the way he was in this game, sort of in contrast to games one and two when he was really struggling, having that floor spacing out there and he was being guarded in a different way than Collins was. And I was appreciative of them rolling with Bay there. It was the right decision and it worked out for them in that spot. Um, late though, it was the Stars making plays. Uh, they, were, they were up five after a bucket. Tatum got back to sort of three-point play on Hunter and then cut it to two with three minutes to go. Trey and Murray actually both missed shots, but then Capella, who I thought was really good in this game, kept it alive twice in a row. And after a long possession, Trey honestly made the biggest shot of the game in my mind. It was a contested three in the right corner, again, after like a minute-long possession with the help of Clint. That was a huge shot. And while they allowed a layup on the other side of the floor, Murray hit another three on the next possession in the corner. So just two huge shots from Trey and Murray from the Stars, honestly, to swing the game. And that was big. Now, Boston didn't just roll over. They hit a three. And uh, I will say, moments later, Tatum missed a wide-open shot for the tie for Boston. So it's not always this simple, but it's a good kind of microcosm in some ways where the Hawks' best two players made their shots. Tatum is an All-NBA guy, you know, top five MVP candidate this year, etc. He had a great look, just missed it, and uh, that leaned things in the Hawks' direction. Then Trey hit a floater to go up by five, and after a stop, he, he made four, four free throws in a row down the stretch to kind of put the game away. In fact, Trey was awesome in the fourth quarter. 15 points on five of nine shooting, including four four at the line, and crucially, no turnovers for Trey in the fourth. He was brilliant. And we've been saying it for a long time. We'll come back to him in a second um, with even more on the on the player breakdown section. But I've said it with Glenn and with Tyler Jones and with John Corrales of Austin Celtics on this podcast. The Hawks have, in my mind, no chance of winning this series or even winning multiple games without Trey playing well. And uh, Trey was really good in this game. So that was a huge factor down the stretch. Both he and DeJounte and the, the Hawks escape with that victory at home. We'll get into the individual player breakdowns now before we wrap up the podcast. Um... Obviously, a lot more good in this one and a positive performance. We'll go to the bench first. Um, Okongwu was pretty quiet. Four points, five rebounds. Did have three blocks, um, two turnovers, five fouls in typical Okongwu fashion. He was fine. I don't think he played great. He was fine, though. Uh, played a reasonable uh, defense throughout the game and uh, just was a, was a solid role player. Jalen Johnson made two big threes. He's still not being guarded, but he took better advantage of that in this game. Had 10 points, had four assists. He had three turnovers, which is probably way too many for a guy to play 13 minutes, but defensively he made some plays. I thought Jalen was much more comfortable, much more assertive, much more aggressive at home than he was on the road. Good to see that from him. And then Bay and Bogey were great. So Bay, 15 points and 27 minutes, eight rebounds, two assists, one turnover. That's important. Three or three from three. Very helpful. Defensively, he wasn't great still, but he was at least kind of competitive. And uh, look, if you're reason, if you're looking for a reason to be skeptical of Sadiq Bay, it's because of the defense. But on offense, when he has it going, he's really difficult to stop. Because he's a good floor spacer, and he's also very physical. So uh, good to see that from Sadiq Bey. He played great in this game. And then Bogey was really good, too, especially in the first half. When nobody else was really cooking in the first half, necessarily, um, Bogey was. 15 points in the game, 4 rebounds, an assist, a steal, and a block. 3-4 um, or from the floor. Uh, sorry, 3-4 from 2-point range, and 3-4 from 3 as well. Very efficient and very, very good in this one off the bench. To the starters. Um, the, the guy who played the least was Collins, which was because Bay closed the game. That was fine with me. I thought Collins was fine. Eight points, five rebounds. He was two, six from three. It was obviously much better than he was the previous game. I think he was one of six or something like that, one of seven in game two. I thought Collins played fine. I think defensively, he's been uh, underratedly pretty good in this series. Offensively, not great. And I think Bay is obviously a better shooter than Collins at this point in time. So I was fine with that. I think that Collins still gets way too much flack at this point. We'll have more on that in the future, I'm sure. But I thought he played fine in the role that he had. Um, I thought Capella was really, really important and good in this one. 10 points, 11 rebounds, had a steal. 5A from the floor, uh, just played good defense in this one kind of as a backline guy. In the second half, that was very important. A couple of big plays, and then offensive rebound-wise, some extra opportunities from Clint. I thought Hunter was not particularly good, honestly. He was actually a game-best plus 10. That was not because of him, to be honest with you. I don't think he was terrible, but 10, 11 points on 11 shots. Um, defensively, he had some, some blow-by issues. I think that on the supporting stuff, in help defense, team defense, he was pretty solid. On ball, not as good in this game. Um, you know, we'll talk about Hunter more in the future, but I thought he was kind of like a C in this one. Like he wasn't terrible, nor was he great, but um, it's kind of funny that he was about, he was a game best plus minus because he was not that good in this game. But the guards were. So DeJounte, 25 points, six rebounds, five assists, two turnovers, rock solid, made a bunch of, made a bunch of big shots. And then Trey, 32 points, nine assists, six rebounds, four turnovers, had two blocks in this game, hilariously, um, but was 10 of 16 on twos. Very efficient there, got to the line six times, made all six. From three, nothing special, two of six, but the bench was just incredible for three-point range, by the way. The three guys who took threes off the bench, Sadiq Bey, Jalen Johnson, Bogdan Bogdanovich, they combined to be eight of ten from three 
And if that happens, you're in great shape. So anyway, lots of credit to go around. You know, Trey was much better in this one, much more comfortable. Maybe it's the home crowd. Maybe he was inspired. And I will say condolences to Trey and his family. I think uh, Trey lost his grandfather. He wrote announced on on Twitter. Um, so that was, un that was obviously unfortunate. And hopefully he's uh, doing all right with that. But he played inspired basketball in this one. He was very good. Good to see that sort of bounce back because I've covered on the, on the last show with Glenn. He has been really bad in the playoffs the last two years. And he was really good in this one in a, a pretty important way. Because you know Trey, DeJounte, both of those guys. And I would also throw Bay and Bogey in there too. If any of those guys does not play as well as they did tonight, they might have lost. So uh, especially Trey. So very, very solid stuff across the board there. We'll get out of here with this. The Hawks now are guaranteed a game five. That's nice. Uh, Boston is still a massive favorite in the series in the betting markets at FanDuel. They're minus 2,000. That's obviously not a lot of respect for the Hawks, but it was a lot higher than that before game three. So the Hawks got a win there. Game four is Sunday in Atlanta, 7 p.m. primetime game. That'll be, I'm sure, rocking at State Farm Arena. I will be back for that one. That'll be fun. And then game five is now, again, guaranteed Tuesday in Boston. So the Hawks will at least have another game to play. And if they win again on uh, on Sunday, they'll be guaranteed two more games. And I think the Hawks kind of similarly, I, I would expect our friends at FanDuel to have kind of a similar line. Hawks is a small underdog in the game on Sunday, and they could win if they play well. If they don't play well, they won't win, but that's kind of where we are at this point in time. Boston is still uh, a loaded team, and they still almost won this game, but I think the Hawks played extremely well. It was fun to see that. I think there, it's definitely room for some upbeat celebration kind of stuff from Hawks fans. Does that mean they're going to win the series? Maybe not, but it's a good night for Atlanta all the way across the board, and uh, certainly a lot to uh, be positive about heading into the weekend. That's it for me on this podcast. Hope, uh, sorry about the uh, fact that it's a little bit shorter and the lack of video, but I do uh, hope, hopefully you guys understand that I will do everything that I can always to give you some podcast content, even in the weirdest of circumstances when it comes to travel. Please subscribe to the podcast across podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, etc. Please rate and review the podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Lotton Hawks. Follow me on Twitter at BT Roland. Follow my written work about the Hawks at patreon.com slash BT Roland. Appreciate everybody listening to the podcast. Enjoy your weekend. We'll be back again after game four on Sunday night.